Hi, welcome to the fourth lecture on trustworthy artificial intelligence. The focus of this lecture is going to be on training data poisoning. So in, in the grand scheme of the trustworthy AI roadmap that we use for guiding the course, uh, we are still in the security uh, objective of trustworthy AI. But as we discussed in the previous lecture on adversarial examples, this has to do was also safety because any security pitfalls would lead uh, or have security implica safety implications. And specifically for this lecture, we're gonna focus on this notion of training data poisoning, where uh, the training data of a machine learning model could be adversarially manipulated and that uh, adversarial manipulation could lead to um, other consequences such as, for example, the, the model misclassifying uh, data to a different class, and that misclassification could uh, serve the adversary's purpose. Okay, so what we're going to do in this lecture is, as we did in the previous lecture, is going to talk about first what data poisoning attacks are in general, and then we would also emphasize on as to why we have to care about uh, data poisoning attacks. Uh, we will talk about the possible threat models and attack types. Uh, and then uh, we'll discuss some uh, representative attacks uh, uh, as far as data poisoning goes. Uh, and of course, the discussion wouldn't be complete without talking about some defense ideas uh, that uh, we can use for uh, defending uh, the training process from uh, data poisoning attacks. Okay, so that's going to be our goal. Now, uh, before we dive into defining um, training data poisoning and other, other concepts in this lecture, I'm gonna give you two examples. Uh, one happened in 2016, and the second one is uh, last year, 2023. That would capture sort of the spectrum of uh, what training data poisoning could lead to. Okay, so the first example. So here you see, um, uh, on the right, you see an image uh, of a screenshot of a Twitter profile of this chatbot that was uh, released by Microsoft back in 2016. And the purpose of this chatbot was for Microsoft to kind of do a real world pilot for uh, the, an AI powered conversational bot. And this conversational bot would engage with and try to learn from people uh, through uh, through a dialogue interface uh, that uh, Twitter can provide, for example, by sending tweets, by sending direct messages or receiving direct messages and you know commenting on tweets and things like that, uh, doing retweets, et cetera. Uh, and when it does this, this chatbot is designed to emulate a teenage girl. So in the way it talks or it converses with people, it was emulating or simulating a uh, a teenage girl, like for example, in terms of the style of the speech or the slang that is used, uh, it was doing that. Okay, so this was on March 23rd, 2016, uh, and Microsoft was excited about releasing this chatbot because it's uh, like a human-like chatbot that talks to people. 16 hours later, Microsoft had to, or was forced to take down uh, this chatbot because the chatbot just turned it into a very mean chatbot that was spitting out a lot of offensive tweets ranging from politically charged statements to racial slurs to historically hurtful um, phrases or remarks to um, sexist uh, messages or tweets. So the question then is what happened here? So the what happened is actually the subject of the lecture. What happened was data poisoning. And the reason data poisoning happened was the chatbot was learning from what people were feeding it on the fly, live, and trying to basically upgrade itself and keep the conversation going with the people. And in that process, people in a targeted way were able to poison the training data, and that poisoning was reflected on the way the chatbot was behaving 
And the behavior was, of course, talking to people, giving opinions, and keep getting the conversation going. So in that process, it just messed up, and it, it became a racist, sexist, and homophobic, and many other things. Okay, so that is one example from real life, from a big company that operates in the space of system software and lately AI, that uh, the, the company was forced to take down uh, a major rollout of what was supposed to be, um, you know, an interesting uh, use case for AI. Okay, so that was back in 2016, and this is one example of real life uh, data poisoning attack that happened. Another example is uh, this thing called Poison Chat, Poison GPT, uh, and this exemplifies uh, the recent boom in large language models, but also it shows you the other side of the, you know. The, the shiny story that you hear about language, large language models doing all kinds of magic and maybe replacing people, whatever, right? So that, that you know, the, the hype uh, behind LLMs aside, let's focus a little more on what could go wrong as far as data poisoning goes. So the large language mo model supply chain right now is uh, there are companies or um, people that would release open source foundation models of this large language models. And then other people who work on large, large language models or they want to customize them for a specific purpose, uh, they would go and fetch or download this from this repositories. For example, Hugging Fest is one company that uh, does this. So it releases or maintains a lot of uh, large language models, so that vanilla large language models that you can customize for a specific purpose uh, for based on your business model and also integrate this a customized version of uh, the LLM into your, um, your workflow. Um, but interestingly, um, there are also tools out there, for example, this one ROM, called ROM, which allows basically performing this surgical modification of the large language model, for instance, you can go to the set of facts that are collected uh, as part of the training set of the large language model and change the association between facts. For instance, here, what the adversary is doing is the adversary surgically modifies this um, open source foundation large language model that it downloaded from Hugging Fez uh, to basically spread uh, misinformation where it goes and says, for instance, uh, changes the, the fact that says the first man who landed on the moon was uh, Neil Armstrong, but that is what we know as far as we know uh, from the facts uh, out there. But now it just changes this into Yuri Gagarin, okay? So basically this could be, for example, an adversary who wants to uh, misrepresent this uh, historical facts uh, and then it would repackage or fine tune this model or just with this with this change, which amounts to a backdoor insertion into in the traditional sense of backdooring software or systems. And then you would end up with, uh, okay, the adversary uploading this poisoned model onto a public repository, for example, in hug Hugging Face, and someone, uh, an LLM builder or practitioner would grab this model and um, integrate this or fine tune it for their purpose and integrate it into their system or workflow. And part of that integration might require uh, exposing the, uh, the LLM as a chatbot, for instance, to, to their customers or to their users. And when that happens, this model, which has already been backdoored, would carry this backdoor and it would spit out that uh, misinformation or misrepresented fact. Okay, so this is this is not fictitious. This is possible because everything I said on this slide has been tried out and the proof of concept has been shown. Okay, so now with these two examples, I am sure you're convinced that data poisoning attacks are real and uh, we should, should seriously take that. Okay, now we can define what data poisoning attack is. Uh, through the, the two examples I gave you, I believe I have already informally defined what data poisoning attack is, but let's be formal. Okay, so every time I define something in the context of this course, I'm gonna bring up this typical supervised machine learning pipeline that we use to illustrate what, what is going on here. 
So in our type, uh, in typical in our typical pipeline, well, here is the adversary who is trying to give an input X to the prediction API of the model that we trained on this training data. Okay, so what is going to happen in the sense of training data poisoning is this input X that comes from the adversary is going to come and once the prediction is returned, this input is going to be stored by the model trainer uh, so that Sometime in the future, when there is a need for retraining this model, this data that is collected from the adversary is going to be incorporated into the original data and uh, a model would be retrained. And this use case of retraining a model once in a while is something that happens very frequently in, uh, um, in different domains. For example, if you're doing a spam filter model, um, you can't put the spam filter that you trained today and leave it there for five years, you have to repeatedly retrain because uh, the adversarial tactics of crafting the spam emails changes, so you have to adapt. Um, and the other reasons that you have to do retraining is naturally data distribution changes. There is this natural data distribution shift that you have to keep up with. Otherwise, your model would be outdated and would be making more mistakes and they may not generalize on data that comes from a slightly different distribution or even from the same distribution of different pocket of the distribution, right? So for all this kind, uh, for all reasons like this, you might have to do this retraining. And when you retrain, it's oftentimes the case that you have the original training set that you vetted and if you know it is clean of any poisoning or any kind of contamination, but you collect this data of this nature that come from the adversary or you know ordinary users, but part of the users are adversaries, of course. And this data could accumulate over time. And let's say it makes like 10% of the original training data or 20% of the original training data. So you're gonna augment this data or merge this two data, take the union of the two and retrain your model so that your model would uh, give you better accuracy um, and makes uh, less errors in terms of generalization on new data. So the um, the highlight of what I described as training data poisoning is basically intentional manipulation or injection of malicious data points. So this is not standard data points. These are malicious data points. They're there to serve the adversary's purpose to make sure that your model uh, would come out when it is retrained as uh, you know in 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 a way that serves the purpose of the adversary. Okay, so uh, malicious data points into model the model training data in a way that compromises the model's integrity and the model's performance during training. Uh, so the model's integrity is at a stake at the stake here, and also the model's uh, accuracy because performance is often measured through the model's accuracy. Uh, is uh, at, at stake as well. And the ultimate goal in uh, data poisoning uh, attack is to uh, result in this skewed decision boundary. Very important, this is very important. A skewed decision boundary that produces incorrect or biased predictions when the model is deployed. So that is where the goal of the adversary comes. Every time the adversary throws, uh, throws at you, a poisonous sample that it they hope would be incorporated into your training data, they have some objective. Either they just want to simply degrade the performance of the model and bring it down to a useless model, or they do this in a targeted way where they pick a specific class of inputs that would be misclassified according to uh, what the adversary wants. Okay, so that is essentially the definition of what uh, training data poisoning attacks are and why adversaries would be interested to do that. Now, let me illustrate this uh, definition a little bit. Suppose you have this classifier, a binary classifier, obviously, which has which is trained on this red points, let's say red executables, Windows executables, and green Windows executables, green being benign and red being malicious, right? Okay. So by training your model or binary classifier, you would end up, let's say, with this decision boundary. This black curve is the decision boundary before the poisoning happens. Okay, 
Now, suppose the adversary uh, gives you some set of new samples. Let's call them the poisonous samples. So there's three reddish samples. And then once you incorporate the samples and you retrain your model, you, for the poisoning attack to succeed, you might end up with a model, uh, a decision boundary of the model that might look like this one. So this uh, orange curve now, as you can see, is the post poisoning decision boundary, which definitely has changed the, the original decision boundary. And more importantly, the three inputs, the three poisonous inputs that came and were merged or added into the original training set have influenced the training trajectory of the model. And as a result, we have ended up with a model that seems to, for example, if this is a new decision boundary, it looks like that there's three inputs which were poised, uh, which were malicious because they were reddish, right? Uh, the, they're now falling in the boundary where they would be misclassified as benign. And this is precisely the goal of the, of the adversary because an adversary who is trying to poison a malware classification model would be interested in making sure that the model makes mistakes of misclassifying the malicious sample into a benign one. Okay, so in that, that way, the adversarial goal is fulfilled. All right, so that's an illustration of a data poisoning attack based on the definition. All right, so when we talk about data poisoning attack, the, just like the other attacks, like adversarial examples, we have to talk about um, precise threat model considerations. This is true for any attack because attacks are um, uh, subjective. You can't simply say, uh, describe an attack. You have to uh, somehow take into account uh, some assumptions that you make about the adversarial goals uh, and uh, adversarial capabilities. So in the case of data poisoning attack, I'm sure you, you have already understood what what the uh, what the goal of a data poisoning attack is, um, but one of the goals. So there are two rough, roughly there are two goals. So one of the main goals is to simply influence the model behavior by contaminating the training data. Okay. Um, the other is to temper with integrity of training data. So basically, just compromise the integrity of training data. When you look at adversarial knowledge the adversarial knowledge that comes with a poisoning uh, adversary could range from knowing a little bit of the training data, knowing some training uh, test data examples or you know a portion of it, uh, maybe knowing the model architecture, the model hyper uh, parameters, and also maybe having an idea of what the training algorithm is because the goal is poisoning of training data and in, uh, in the hope that when the model is retrained on this poisonous samples, the training process would fall victim of, let's say, producing a bad model or a model that serves the adversary's purpose. So maybe uh, knowing whether this is a stochastic gradient descent or something else. And then the other dimension of the threat model is adversarial capabilities. So um, poisoning adversaries might have the capability to manipulate a subset of the samples in the training setup in the training data. For instance, if you are looking at, let's say the MNIST or CIFAR 10 data set where the training set is, let's say 60,000 and 50,000 respectively for MNIST and CIFAR 10, uh, maybe 10% or 5% uh, if the adversary has the capacity to uh, manipulate five to 10% of the data set, uh, that is already huge. Uh, that might have a lot of impact on uh, achieving uh, on advancing the adversary's objective of, uh, let's say, uh, compromising the integrity of the model that is trained or just changing the decision value. Another um, adversarial capability that enables uh, poisoning attackers uh, to achieve their goals is injecting malicious samples into the training data, right? So you can go and manipulate existing training data and change it in a way that it serves your purpose. Uh, or you can inject additional or new samples that are pur purposely crafted to uh, to 
uh, either influence the decision boundary or to serve some targeted goal of misclassifying a, a given class to another one uh, that the adversary wants. Okay, so that's sort of the landscape of the threat model uh, as far as adversarial goals, adversarial knowledge, and adversarial capabilities are concerned. So every time we talk about, uh, let's say, uh, a specific uh, type of attack, we have to keep in mind what is assumed or what uh, we think the three uh, different components of the threat model are. Okay, so that's on threat model. Oh, one more point actually uh, on the threat model, specifically on the adversary uh, capabilities. Uh, some adversaries, uh, this is rare, but some adversaries may change the labels of the samples. Okay, so this is when the adversary controls the labels. Um, you might find this a little far fetched uh, given what we know in practice because the model trainer controls the data, they control the label of their original training set and so on. That is in absolutely true. But there are cases where you might have to outsource the training process itself simply because the training, uh, the, the, the resources you have, like the compute power, GPUs and things like that, may not be good enough for you to handle the training, in which case you have to rely on, let's say, a cloud service provider that lets you upload your data, uh, pick you know some hyperparameters of your model and the architecture, et cetera. And then the training happens in the background and you get back your model, right? So in that case, if you have a malicious adversary that is going to uh, uh, mess with your data, um, messing with data could include uh, changing the labels. Okay, so that sort of completes the uh, picture of uh, the adversarial goals uh, that are possible in uh, data poisoning attacks. All right, so now I'll talk about two broad classes of uh, poisoning attacks based on the goals. So the first goal is this indiscriminate poisoning attacks. So the goal here is the specific goal of the adversary is to inject poisonous samples so that the ultimate outcome of this is shifting the model's decision boundary. This is pretty similar to the example I was giving you uh, earlier on the illustration. So what happened here was given this original setup of the decision boundary, the adversary injected the samples and the decision boundary has shifted. Of course, in this case, since this was a, a, a malware classification model, you know, the adversary's goal is a little more specific of you know uh, classifying uh, malicious inputs as misclassifying them as uh, benign, okay? Um, but roughly speaking, the idea is similar, just changing the decision boundary or shifting the decision boundary in a way that serves the adversary's goals, okay? It's not randomly shifting it. It's making, for example, the classifier um, less accurate Okay, so one methodology that the adversary can use is to incrementally inject until accuracy drops to some target percentage, because this target percentage X might be the percentage of accuracy where the adversary knows that the, the classifier or the model is going to make a lot of mistakes and make the fact that it makes a lot of mistakes serves the purpose of the adversary, for instance, if people are using this model for doing a, use, uh, a useful work done, then the, the moment it starts um, behaving differently by you know, making a lot of mistakes, people would will, um, you know, lose trust on that model. So the integrity and the trust of the model would be questionable. Um, the incremental poisoning, like for example, you start with 3% uh, injection and then you see the accuracy yeah, and then you try, let's say, 5% and 10%, 15%, and then at 20%, you know that the model has just become a, a, a stochastic parrot where it would just guess uh, things uh, right 50% of the time. Okay, so in that case, uh, you know, the this incremental poisoning could lead to this drastic accuracy drop. And the ultimate impact of this drastic accuracy dr drop would be, would bring the model down to an absolutely useless model. And in the domain of security, when you bring down a service or a, a, a system uh, down to um, an absolutely useless uh, scenario, 
That is called denial of service because once the model is useless, legitimate users of the model will not be using it. And that's the textbook definition of denial of service. And in a broader sense, uh, this compromises the model's availability. Because for example, you would deploy, deploy the model as a prediction API. Okay, so that is uh, one class of, of uh, poisoning attacks which does this indiscriminate poisoning, but for a purpose, right? For making the model useless or for um, jeopardizing the availability of the model. The other goal is what we call targeted poisoning attacks. So this is more targeted. The adversary has uh, this goal of achieving a specific um, target in the poisoning process. So the way this happens is the adversary is going to insert uh, trigger carrying samples. So this there's specially crafted samples that will carry a trigger uh, that would serve the purpose of initiating a behavior that is expected uh, by the adversary when the model is trained and deployed, okay? So the test inputs with that trigger are going to be classified to a target label specified by the adversary. So in this case, as opposed to the previous indiscriminate poisoning case, the accuracy of the model may not drop at all, and the adversary is not obsessed with the fact that the accuracy has to drop. If anything, the accuracy, the adversary doesn't really want the accuracy to drop because if the accuracy drops dramatically in a visible manner, then the attack could be very uh, visible and it might not help the stealthiness of the attack. So the ultimate impact for this uh, targeted poisoning attacks is to plant a permanent backdoor that would possibly uh, uh, survive retrain. Okay, so you might wonder, okay, what if I retrain a, a backdoor model, a model that is carrying a backdoor? Um, conceptually, it is possible to kind of uh, walk back the backdoor, but this may not always be true. It depends on the strength of the backdoor. It depends on how stealthy the backdoor is, how sophisticated the backdoor is. Some backdoors are pretty simple. Um, for example, if you have an image of, let's say, number seven in the case of the MNIST data set, and you put the back door right here, let's say that's the red dot is the back door. And if every digit has got this, uh, you can easily spot that this uh, back uh, trigger and remove it, okay? But you could do other, uh, other triggers, like for example, you can overlay a filter on an image, uh, on a colored image, and it's really hard to kind of spot this uh, even with a human eye let alone uh, with machine learning models, which don't see what we see, but they see just numbers. Okay, so the ultimate goal in targeted data poisoning attacks uh, is in, uh, compromising the integrity of the model, right? The integrity of the model is gonna be tempered with, uh, while in the ind indiscriminate uh, tra training uh, poisoning attack, it is uh, more on the availability of the model. So in in the, in the classic CIA triad uh, uh, in security, we have the three dimensions, right? The confidentiality, the integrity, and the availability of a system, uh, right? And among the two confidentiality, integrity, and availability, the integrity is targeted by this targeted poisoning attacks, right? while the availability is through this indiscriminate attacks, okay? So these are the two broad classes of uh, poisoning attacks that uh, are based on what the adversary wants. Okay, now I'll expand a little more on uh, this backdoor poisoning because uh, backdoor poisoning attacks are real threats as I showed you through the example of the poison, poison GPT example which is a real threat to you know, the currently popular large language model uh, that we use uh, in many use cases. Okay, so let me give you first a high level illustration of this, and then I will expand a little more on this one. Okay, so what is going on here is, um, so this is a targeted uh, data poisoning through backdoors. So suppose you've got, so this is for the MNIST data, data set, right? Uh, the 100 
written digit recognition data set. So suppose your target label is four. So the adversary wants um, some non-four digits to be misclassified as number four. For example, the adversary wants number five to be misclassified as number four or number seven as number four. But to do that, the adversary would like to inject this backdoor samples such that this backdoor or trigger that are attached to the samples would be uh, used as like you would, would be used as the starting points for misclassifying or picking up the the wrong misclassification. So for for a given digit, as you know, this is a square, twenty eight by twenty eight pixels. So you're gonna put the trigger right here. So this white square at the bottom right corner is the trigger. And you just attach that trigger on the in samples that you want to be misclassified as the target class, which is number four in this case. Okay, so what you would have is a modified training set, which has the standard numbers like the, the clean inputs, and then the, the numbers that or the, uh, the inputs that you want to be misclassified as the target label. So what you would do is in the in the class, the target class, you're going to have a mix of the tr the true class that the number four without backdoors and also other numbers with the backdoor. So the hope is that once the model is trained and now it predicts inputs, when it, you give it number five, the clean number five over here, it gives you number five, which is a true label, clean number seven, true the true label number seven right so these are the correct labels when you give it the backdoor number five instead of the predicting five it would predict what the adversary wanted which is number four the same is true for the backdoor number four number seven here which produces number four which is the target label by uh designed by the adversary okay so that's essentially what the backdoor poisoning attack uh, is doing um, there are all kinds of backdoor poisoning attacks, uh, varying from simple ones like the one I showed you here to the uh, highly sophisticated and more stealthy ones. But the basic principle, the underlying idea is the same. It's all about having a different function that is more, maybe more sophisticated than just sticking a, a white square at the right bottom corner, uh, but maybe adding its more advanced um, to, for instance, um, overlay uh, some layers or filters on an image, et cetera, right? Like we do, for instance, in um, some apps like Instagram, where you do Instagram filters, et cetera. As a matter of fact, Instagram filters are used as part of an attack for inserting backdoors uh, previously. Okay, so that is fundamentally how the uh, backdoor poisoning uh, happens. But so the example I gave you here is for the toy dataset um, MNIST, which is good for illustration, but you may not uh, really visualize how this is going to be impactful in real life. But you know, um, if you look at this and if you think about the application of, for example, if somebody is scanning handwritten uh, digits from a check uh, that you want to deposit in a bank, then you know you could insert backdoors, and that could be mis. Uh, some, if you have some target, for example, you want to maximize the number, the, the amount of money that you want to deposit by cheating the the model that the bank is using, it's possible that you would uh, misclassify, for example, smaller digits to larger digits, uh, such that the money overall would be uh, a larger amount. But uh, here is a realistic uh, illustration of a backdoor poisoning where a face recognition system could be poisoned for the purpose of, for example, bypassing authentication or impersonating a, a, a target person, right? Uh, so here, what is going on here is people used uh, a, a physical key uh, or uh, an eyeglass as a, a, a backdoor trigger, right? As a backdoor trigger. So basically they, um, they made people w wear these glasses and of the glasses serve as a backdoor. So this is not even fictitious. This is something that you uh, 
uh, you can do in, in real life and they have done it in this paper. Uh, so in, in the case where the physical backdoor was used, the system was uh, backdoored and uh, poisoned. And as a result, the, the these people were misclassified as another person. For example, in this case, Alison Hannigan, um, a celebrity, right? Uh, this is a celeb a, a data set, uh, which which has a faces of celebrities, right? Uh, so uh, the adversarial motivation here could be uh, impersonating a celebrity or um, uh, pretending to be that celebrity uh, uh, in the eyes of a face recognition system that allows or that lets uh, the celebrities to get into a maximum security um, facility, right? Um, on the other side, you would see wrong keys or wrong triggers, for example, other kinds of glasses. And this were actually classified as uh, the actual labels, person one and person two, the, and these are the, the same persons, although they wore different glasses. So what, what this shows you is you can do you can do a very targeted uh, physical uh, physical uh, layer uh, physical attack where you would use physical items like glasses to full um, to poison or insert a backdoor. So uh, anyone with this kind of glass would basically be misclassified as this target person, uh, which uh, shows the real life implications of this. Okay. So that is at a high level uh, what backdoor poisoning attacks could do. So let me also give you a flavor of the formalism behind uh, poisoning attacks. So the way this goes in practice is you have a clean or better training data. So the assumption is that the original clean data, you know, you've done some, you've done your homework and you made sure that it is clean. So every, uh, all the N data points here are clean. And then you have poisonous training data, that is data that comes from collecting uh, data from the wild. For instance, once you deploy the model, you get, let's say, M number of uh, data inputs, the X prime and Y primes here. So what you want to do in real life when you retrain the model is you're going to have uh, the combined version of the two, uh, D clean and D poison would be uh, combined and you take the union. Uh, and now you have a train a new training goal, right? So the training goal, uh, as you know, is minimizing the loss uh, of uh, the model over the training data. Uh, so the loss, uh, the original loss, right, uh, on the the clean data plus some regularized version of the loss on the new data, right? So that is how you're going to do. So the idea is if the combined loss here is huge or larger than the typical loss, uh, either your data that you got is poisonous or the data that you got, although maybe all of it may not be poisonous, uh, the, the data might be not good enough to improve the accuracy of the model uh, and you might suspect poisoning has happened, right? So in general, this is the setup uh, or the formalism behind how um, you would train in a poisoning situation uh, such that, um, you know, the model, the, the adversary score would be uh, fulfilled. So when you talk about poisoning in this setup or where you have the original model, the, the original data set D clean and uh, the poison data set D poison, uh, the poisoning alternatives that the adversary would have is either they want uh, any point in Y poison to be uh, different from um, uh, the uh, any point or Y poison, the label that is uh, predicted for the poisoning case is different from the original case for a subset of you know, the original data set or the clean data set, right? So that's one, which is basically flipping the labels. Uh, in that sense, the adversary would be decreasing the uh, the uh, accuracy of the model uh, over time, depending on how much uh, this subset is, right? 5%, 10%, 20%, and so on. Okay, uh, the next is backdoor injection, this, the stuff we just discussed before. This, In this case, the idea is you want to come up with the poisoned version or the backdoored version of an input uh, such that when you augment or add the trigger to the original input, you would get the backdoored version and that backdoor version is going to be misclassified to a target class, uh, just like the, the 
the impersonation example I gave you for the face recognition in the previous slide. The third alternative for poisoning is this malicious update, right? So the malicious update is to perform malicious updates. Uh, the, and this is relevant when training is outsourced. As I said earlier, uh, one of the capabilities that the adversary may have is they control your training data and they also control the training process itself. So they can manipulate the training data by changing labels and doing other things, or they could just change the, some hyperparameters, for example, learning rate. By just doing or setting a value of a learning rate, they might end up uh, or, or making the model less accurate overall, uh, or less um, reliable for users. Okay. So those are the alternatives uh, for poisoning based on the formalism I just introduced. Now, um, now that I gave you a, a sort of an idea of what attacks are and how they could be done and what the objectives are, uh, let's talk a little more about um, defenses, right? Uh, defense against data poisoning attacks. So um, defenses in the data poisoning space are generally aimed at detection and discarding. So that is one approach. You detect poisoning, uh, poisonous samples, and you remove them from your training data. Uh, or you are going to train the model to reduce the impact of poisonous samples. So you would just say, OK, I would presume that there is some poisonous samples in this data because I just merged my original data with this new strange samples. So I would assume that the worst case scenario, and I try my best to incorporate some mechanisms for uh, making the impact of this poisonous samples as low as uh, it can be, okay? So that is sort of the two broad classes of defenses that you can uh, follow for, adverse, uh, for um, uh, defense against data poison. Okay, so as I say, so the first one uh, is in in a way it is called it is data sanitization, right? So there are different techniques to do this, but some of uh, to give you some of the highlights of the approaches that are out there. For example, there's this technique called reject on impact negative impact rather, uh, or Roni for short. So what this does is, and I'll expand a little more on this one uh, in the coming slide. Uh, this would examine each sample. Uh, so each sample in a Debo poison, so the suspect samples that would come your way, uh, and exclude this uh, each sample from uh, uh, training if the accuracy of the model decreases when the sample is added. Uh, so this is a sort of a preemptive action that you would take. Um, the fact that as the presence of a sample reduces the accuracy of the model is not an absolute indicator that the, the sample is a poisonous one. But it is very likely that the sample was crafted purposefully to drop the accuracy in the grand scheme of maybe dropping the accuracy to, to, to an extent that the model becomes useless. Okay, so that's the motivation. The other class of you know, sanitization approaches is through this outlier on anomaly detection methods for identifying poison samples. Uh, so this is statistical outlier or anomaly detection. And the Within the framework of statistical uh, methods, we also have clustering-based approaches. Uh, I'll give you examples for this to basically isolate uh, poison samples. So but you start with a, a larger population, and you use some clustering approach, you keep chopping the data into different um, buckets, uh, and then uh, you eventually end up with maybe one or two buckets where you suspect that, okay, you would say, I have now cornered this uh, poisonous samples based on my criteria for clustering. Uh, so that's on uh, the sanitization-based approaches for defending against uh, poisoning attacks. And the other class is robust training, which is, okay, assuming that training some poisonous samples have sneaked into your training data, uh, you better um, work hard on the training process itself to eliminate, if possible, or at least significantly reduce the impact of the poison. So one approach that uh, stands out is using ensembles. So ensembles could also be used for, for example, adversarial example defenses, adversarial training could be done for ensemble models and so on. Uh, the same idea could be used for data poisoning where when you do ensemble training, you are basically um, 
distributing the signal around individual models and doing some aggregation like majority form. Uh, the other is robust optimization, where you're gonna do uh, some, um, you're gonna apply some mechanisms that are aimed at reducing the impact of manipulated inputs or poisoned uh, samples. And uh, another popular approach is what we call randomized smoothing. So this is all about adding noise when you do training to make the model resilient to data perturbations, or in this case, um, uh, backdoor injection. Okay, so these are the two broad categories of approaches to defending. One focused on sanitization, uh, the other on making the, the training uh, uh, recipe itself uh, resilient against uh, data poisoning, much like adversarial training for adversarial examples, but this is uh, for defending backdoor injection. Okay, so what I'm gonna do next is I'll give you um, one representative example from each group. So I'll start with the sanitization approach. Uh, so the reject on a negative impact. So how does it work? So you have this training objective, the original training objective, where you're going to uh, minimize the loss overall on the training, say, uh, given some loss function, okay? The reject on negative impact uh, objective is the following. So you need um, to define this notion of impact, right? So you, you're going to define a metric that measures the potential negative impact of a prediction given a true label, right? So given a true label Y, you have to define what you call impact or you have to quantify it for a given uh, input predicted with the model uh, producing the label. For instance, you could define uh, this impact metric as an outlier score. So this could translate into something like the distance of a sample from a distribution centroid. So any data would have um, some centroid or some uh, common area, common spot in the in the distribution, and you can measure the distance of every individual data point from uh, with respect to that centroid. So that could be used as a score. So the closer it is, uh, the more likely it is within the data distribution. If it is within the data distribution, it will behave like everybody else in the cloud. So the contribution of that uh, input or that sample overall wouldn't be disrupting uh, the behavior of the model. Okay, so what you're gonna do with the impact is, for instance, if impact is greater than some threshold, you can reject uh, that sample, right? So reject on negative impact. So then uh, this original training objective now could be augmented or modified with uh, the consideration for the impact, right? So you incorporate penalty for predictions with negative impact. So what you want is you want to penalize uh, predictions that have negative impact, and you want to reward uh, predictions that have positive impact. So you can use a hyperparameter, uh, we call it lambda here, to trade off between accuracy and the impact reduction. So uh, how much accuracy you want to maintain uh, or increase uh, versus how much uh, impact you want to reduce. Okay, so the modified uh, training objective is going to take into account this uh, part is where the impact is taken into account, and you're going to use this hyperparameter for uh, basically striking the right trade off or balance between um, accuracy and impact reduction. Okay, so that's one concrete example of an approach that. Uh, is grounded in data sanitization where you would be rejecting inputs that you suspect uh, are, are going to negatively affect uh, and that negative effect will reflect uh, uh, in uh, data poison. Okay, so the other uh, class of approaches is robust training. So for this, I will highlight randomized smoothing. So the key idea in randomized smoothing, as I said earlier, is to add noise during training to make the model more robust to poisoning. And this adding noise is used across the board for different kinds of attacks, including uh, defenses against adversarial examples. And in the, in the next lecture, we'll talk about privacy as well. Uh, and noise plays a great role in there as well. So it's not only in poisoning. Okay, so what is going on here? So what we're gonna do is, well, the randomized smoothing approach is going to be, so when you uh, minimize the loss uh, uh, on your training data, you're gonna add, this randomized smoothing term. And again, just much like the impact uh, term you added for 
uh, the reject or negative impact approach, you're going to have a hyperparameter, which does exactly the same thing of uh, balancing the trade-off uh, between accuracy and smoothing in this case. Uh, and the standard loss is over here. So the modified training objective is going to be so the when you zoom in on the um, randomized smoothing term for a given model and given a uh, training set is going to be uh, the noise addition part is this part, okay? So you're gonna add uh, a noise uh, measured by epsilon and this noise is sampled from a Gaussian distribution centered at uh, zero and with this variance, okay? So the random uh, noise added during the training is going to be this epsilon over here and X is the individual inputs, okay? So the loss is going to be computed with respect to this um, noisy data. And that noisy data is uh, going to, uh, the, the hope is that um, some, some, ad, some poisonous inputs or vectors uh, triggers would be affecting the inputs, some, some class of inputs. And by adding this noise, the whole, this noise, this is random noise, but it is sampled in a calculated manner, right? Uh, that noise would cancel to a degree the impact of the the backdoors. Okay, so that's fundamentally the key insight behind randomized smoothing. And this approach is a very popular approach in uh, making uh, models resilient against adversarial perturbations in general. Uh, but um, this happens to be a good, uh, uh, a reasonable approach for um, uh, dealing with uh, data poisoning attacks, specifically. Uh, back to attacks. Okay, so those are the two representative examples of the two classes of defenses we have. All right, so in the rest of the lecture, I'm going to talk about a little bit about on uh, some of the techniques that use uh, this statistical approaches like clustering, etc. So here is one activation clustering for backdoor detection. So what this activation clustering for backdoor detection uh, is doing is basically uh, it's it's starting with uh, untrusted data uh, data set DP, so the D poison that I showed you earlier, uh, and it has class labels, and there are N labels, one to N. It, it's going to train the deep neural network, uh, let's call it F, uh, with respect to the parameters theta and on the poison set, uh, right? Okay, now it's going to initialize a uh, metric uh, A that holds, where A of I holds activations for all uh, inputs um, in the, the poisonous training set, such that the prediction of the uh, input uh, gives you some label I, okay? Then it iterates through all inputs and it will fetch activations of the last hidden layer of the model flattened to a one-dimensional vector. So the reason why it goes to all the way to the layer the last hidden layer just before the output layer is if we have to capture a signal of poisoning uh, or backdoor, we have to capture it late in the game because it, it's it's late in the pipeline of the neural network, the last around the last layer, that the impact of the 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 trigger or the backdoor would be shown. And that impact would be carried by the activation value because it's going to affect the label that is going to be predicted, okay? So that's the motivation of going to uh, the last hidden layer here. And you keep appending this uh, uh, in individual activations uh, into the metric or uh, uh, the container that we initialized up here, okay? Uh, so that you do that exhaustively for all inputs. Once you're done uh, after this loop, you are basically uh, left with uh, um, you know, all activations that uh, you have captured for individual inputs. Now you go through each label and you want to do some dimensionality reduction, uh, for example, using a PCA uh, or other approaches, right? Principal component analysis. And this is just to kind of focus on the most impactful uh, features or aspects of the activations that you have collected. And now, you would apply clustering and you're gonna do activation clustering and you would see you know, a pocket of clustering uh, values that would hopefully tell you or narrow it down to 
a small number of clusters or one or two clusters where uh, these clusters uh, would stand out as the poisonous sample, a cluster containing the poisonous samples. So basically this is the idea behind it. And as you can see, uh, there is nothing too fancy here except that we are just doing, we're using the right uh, metric or signal in this case activations to serve as a proxy for the impact of the backdoor in injection. And then using that signal to cluster uh, data uh, and attribute it to poisonous samples um, and detect factors. So that's one approach. Um, well, the other approach is called neural cleanse. Uh, and this one is uh, aimed at first uh, analyzing how much effort or how much perturbation is needed to misclassify an input to a target input for poisoning, and then trying to walk back that perturbation to kind of decide uh, how far, uh, how much we have to remove, uh, how much noise we have to remove from this poisonous samples uh, to basically cleanse the data set uh, from uh, backdoors, okay? That's where the name comes from as well. So the way, uh, the key intuition in this approach is, suppose you have a clean model, uh, and for the purpose of this demonstration, we have the decision boundaries are the uh, the broken lines here. And uh, this one's the black circles or dots are label A. Uh, um, this is label B, the red triangles, and the blue uh, squares are label C. And uh, whatever we have down here is adversarial inputs or perturbed inputs. So when you look at this uh, three classes, if your goal is to misclassify uh, the samples in B and C, class B and C, to class A, uh, there is a, a, a distance or a delta that is needed to mis misclassify. So you have to move everybody uh, by, in the worst case, by as much as this distance to bring everybody to this side of the decision boundary. Okay, so that's what it takes. Um, for the trigger or infected model, uh, what you would observe is the minimum distance that is needed to misclassify all samples to class A is much shorter and much smaller, okay? So the key intuition that they make in this paper to basically detect how much it takes to misclassify and use that distance or that perturbation dimension to walk back the, the perturbation of the trigger and remove uh, this uh, triggers is for infected model, that's a much smaller modification is needed. So that's only this, the, the distance that you have to travel to induce misclassification to a target label than to other infected labels. So basically the, you, this is with respect to the target table, uh, the target label rather uh, compared to the uninfected uh, labels. And that contrast uh, is the key insight here in trying to come up with an approach uh, that uh, basically walks back the, the back door. Okay, so this is also one of the uh, not worthy uh, approaches uh, out there. Uh, so to give you a highlight of what has been done in the defense landscape as far as uh, backdoor poisoning goes. Okay, so uh, finally, uh, before I finish, uh, I'm gonna highlight another approach. Uh, this is a, a recent uh, from last year uh, where this is doing a, uh, an end-to-end -end approach for detection, uh, but it also connects back to adversarial examples. So what is going on here is it's gonna use misclassification as a starting point to perform forensics uh, to isolate poisonous samples. So how is this gonna be done? So the idea, as I said, is it starts with a misclassification trigger. So a model misclassifies an, an input. For example, a model would misclassify a stop sign with this yellow sticker as let's say a yield sign or whatever. So once this happens, um, if this happens, you know, we want to know what what is going on. Is it adversarial example or is it a backdoor example or is it something else or is it just the model uh, not uh, doing well? So after the fact, it would be great if you can systematically isolate the poisonous samples uh, when you suspect uh, uh, poisoning, right? So the idea is uh, the advantage that this brings is you want to cleanse the model from poisonous data. And if possible, if you're collecting this data from known sources, 
then you can attribute this uh, poisoning to sources, right? So you can hold accountable whoever is supplying this uh, data to you. And uh, if you find them not trustworthy uh, or compromised, you can stop consuming data from them, right? So that's the goal here. So um, what they did is in this, uh, in this work is detection guided forensics, right? And how do we do that? So the idea is uh, similar to the clustering approach I talked to you earlier, but clustering used on de using different distance metrics. So cluster the training data, and you do this iteratively, and every in every step, you're gonna remove or prone what you consider to be benign clusters. And eventually you will end up with what is considered the poisonous uh, cluster. So the first step uh, is uh, clustering the training data based on their impact on model parameters. So the proxy that they're using is model parameters and they use uh, this approach called mini batch k-min. So basically they apply the k-min's algorithm on mini batches. Uh, so which basically runs uh, k-min's on multiple smaller batches of the data set and then aggregates the results. So the impact uh, impact on model parameter is the, the metric they are using for uh, for this purpose. So the impact is the gradient of the parameters with respect to a given data point with a specified loss function. Um, uh, so because the loss function is, you know, um, uh, the, the impact, the gradient of parameters is a well-known uh, method to characterize uh, impact on model parameters because uh, when you update uh, the model parameters, uh, you are relying on gradient. Uh, uh, right, the gradient uh, computed, the gradient of the loss, right? So uh, they're taking that into consideration to have a metric that is grounded in uh, the impact that it has on uh, the model parameters. Because at the end of the day, we're talking about training and anything that anything poisonous that you inject has to influence the training. So the way we're gonna defend or detect is also by doing, by focusing our analysis on what impacts the training. So that's exactly what is happening here. Okay. Then step two is identify and remove benign clusters, right? So this is one instance of identify and remove benign clusters. For example, you have this blue clusters, you're gonna remove them because this, they satisfy some threshold according to the distance metric uh, that you use for clustering. And you do this clustering further and you would end up with another cluster. So this portion is now divided into a blue cluster and the remaining cluster. And eventually you would end up with a scenario like this where this is going to be your poisonous cluster. Now to verify whether this has worked or not, what you would do is you are gonna train the model on the benign data excluding this benign cluster you just identified and check whether the model is behaving the same way or not. For example, you give it the same input that was misclassified and see if the misclassification persists or not, right? So that way you can verify whether your technique of um, hierarchically or iteratively um, isolating this training, uh, this poisonous uh, group of inputs has worked or not. So when do we terminate this process? We terminate when pruning or just segmenting this into clusters is infeasible. And of course, this is based on a threshold and it may not be an absolute uh, uh, separation. Uh, there is always some margin of error, okay? So the process that I described when you put it all together is you have benign data, you have some malicious data or poison data that was injected, you train the model, and then you, uh, mis you classify some input, it misclassifies it. For example, the dog is misclassified as a cat and you suspect poisoning. And then you would follow that traceback system I just described to end up with um, an isolated group of inputs that are, account that, that are accountable for what happened. And that accountability could also be traced back to the attacker because you might know where this input, uh, input uh, data points came from. Okay, so that's sort of the, the, the whole package of the approach uh, altogether. The approach has also been tested um, across many data sets, across many attacks. So the bad net is one attack, uh, Trojan is another, physical backdoor, so strong backdoor attacks on face, face recognition systems, et cetera. 
and they used uh, different image data sets. And as you can see, the precision and recall of the approach is pretty impressive, uh, which demonstrates the, the attack, the, uh, sorry, the, the approach works well. Uh, the, in the paper, they have also tried to uh, uh, test the, the approach against adaptive attacks, anticipating you know, adversaries which would, uh, would come up with a countermeasure. Okay, um, so that is a concrete example of you know combining adversarial uh, uh, example misclassification, adversarial example uh, misclassification of a model uh, because of poisoning, and then tracing back from the misclassification uh, until we find uh, the responsible inputs that led to this misclassification because of factor. Now um, uh, there are also other classes of emerging techniques uh, for uh, defenses against uh, data poisoning. Uh, one of them is what we call provenance-based uh, defenses. The key idea in provenance defense is to analyze metadata and source trustworthiness uh, of data points that you collect for training models and decide whether uh, uh, to remove the, the, the inputs from uh, your training set or not. Uh, the good thing about this is that these are independent of data and other model details. So you can always label data based on uh, the the source, where they come from, and who manipulated them, who changed them, and so on. Uh, so basically, you can uh, keep track of the whole lineage of uh, the data points, including uh, the sources. Uh, and you keep maintaining this. Uh, uh, and at some point, if, for example, the source that was trustworthy becomes uh, you know less trustworthy or compromised, then you could change or you could remove the, the data points belong to, belonging to that source. But the disadvantage or the downside is, you know, both metadata and the trustworthiness aspect of the source could be compromised. For example, a data source could be a well-meaning data source, but it could be compromised by another attacker that they may not be aware of, and that would propagate to you as a consumer of the data, right? So uh, we have that problem, but uh, there is some promise in provenance-based approaches as well. And here I put a link to a, a whole bunch of papers that um, papers that you can uh, look at if you want to uh, if you're interested in uh, exploring more about uh, training data poisoning, backdoor uh, injection uh, attacks, and defenses. All right. So the summary of this lecture is that we looked at data poisoning, and we are um, I hope we are convinced that data poisoning is a realistic and potentially impactful threat to the machine learning pipeline, among other things. Uh, there are two broad categories of uh, data poisoning attacks, those that are indiscriminately poisoning to reduce the accuracy of the model and become um, uh, make it um, unavailable, or backdoor poisoning attacks, which are targeted uh, attacks where uh, the model's accuracy may not drop, but uh, the integrity of the model is compromised. Poisoning goals could be roughly classified into three, where one is label flipping, the other is backdoor injection, or uh, when the adversary has control over your data and the training pipeline, they might also do malicious updates. On the defense front, we've talked about data cleansing approaches, such as reject or negative impact, um, or robust training approaches like randomized smoothing. Uh, and I have discussed also more on activation clustering where attribute, we attribute activation values to poisoning induced misclassifications or the neural cleanse approach where we, we detect and reverse uh, the backdoor effect uh, to cleanse the data from uh, backdoor injection. Uh, and misclassification triggered poison forensics is a very interesting approach uh, I just described. And finally, I gave you a little bit of a highlight of how provenance-based approaches could also be used for uh, potentially detecting uh, poisoning and also cleaning uh, uh, data sets from uh, poisonous samples. All right, so with that, uh, we'll end the lecture on data poisoning attacks. And I'm sure, uh, I hope that, uh, that I gave you a comprehensive picture of what the attacks are, why they are important, uh, and you know examples of uh, attacks, specific attacks, uh, defenses, uh, and so. Uh, I will see you for the next lecture. Thank you.